So Dr. Terry Jones is a naturopathic physician. She's actually from Portland, Oregon, where I practiced for many years. And she became the medical director of Precision Analytical Testing Company some years ago. I, I think it's been about four years. And she does an amazing job of lecturing for them. She's super active on Instagram. If you want to follow her on there, she does a ton of education about really specific things about hormones and pathways, um, metabolism. It's very interesting. So you can search her on Instagram. Maybe I can pull up her or her handle while we're talking here. And she's a great resource. We're lucky to have her on within Hormone Detox Shop. We do run um, panels, uh, the Dutch test in particular, and the, especially the Dutch Complete, which is a one-day test that tests not only your sex hormones for men and women, um, but also adrenal hormones, melatonin, some neurotransmitters. And it does an amazing job at looking at metabolisms or metabolites because it tests the urine. So urine is a waste product. So it's easy to see how the body is breaking down hormones um, into waste products and if they're going into the right category or camp as, as they're detoxified. So it's pretty interesting stuff. We're going to actually look at some tests, which is why I want her camera to work. Um, but if she can't get her camera on, I have a couple tests that I can share on my side as well. Do a little, a little talk up, <laughs> but everybody, this is Dr. <laughs> Carrie Jones. And uh, Carrie, you might have exchanged some emails about some example calls I, or example tests. I could use the ones we have, or if you came up with a couple more, I'm happy to. Uh, um, I do have a couple more. Do you want me to, um, do you want me to screen share? Yeah, maybe let's just do a quick intro. And then I think it will be most interesting for people once we get into the sharing and looking. So we'll just do a quickie. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I talked a bit about you. Maybe let's talk about how does it, because I don't know this one, how did this company get started? And you know, why should we choose this type of test? Right. Well, so it got started by Mark Newman back in 2012. And um, he was working for a different company, a different hormone company at the time and wanted to branch off into uh, dried urine testing um, because he wasn't convinced about all the accuracy when it came to saliva testing and hormone replacement. And so he created Precision Analytical and the Dutch test was formed. And so that was like, I want to say like summer of 2012. And then I started working with them in about the like late winter of 2012. Um, and it grew from there. So I've been with them almost from the beginning. Oh, awesome. And is it yeah. only, someone was just asking, is it only dried urine they do or there are some other we, types of tests? We do um, because we, the cortisol awakening response is, um, can only be done in saliva. So we have a combination dried urine um, and their uh, saliva, we call them salivettes. So they're like little cotton swabs that you suck on like a piece of candy. Um, oh, and okay. you do that in, just in the, in the morning to focus on the cortisol awakening response and then around dinner and before bed. So like if somebody has issues there, then we do have a combo, but predominantly the dried urine is what we do, which is pretty easy to collect. Okay. Yeah. It's very easy. Um, you know, when I was a student, I was learned the saliva testing, but mm -hmm. I, everyone was talking, talking, talking about the Dutch. And I was like, what is this Dutch thing? <laughs> I want to do the, what the cool kids are doing. Uh, and we never looked back. We don't run any salivary tests anymore. Yeah. Uh, I'm really happy with, um, especially we run the Dutch complete, I was saying, and we can talk about that, but just the, the range of information it gives you is really fantastic. I personally think the sex hormone aspect is the best part of the Dutch test, but occasionally, you know, you'll get a client who that part wasn't as insightful as they thought, but some other markers were quite interesting. So I like, Definitely. Um, I like the broad spectrum of a Dutch complete. Which is what's the bonus of urine is that you get, um, you know, you get the metabolism or detoxification pathways. And so people like to see that. They like to see, okay, I have estrogen. Where does it go? I have testosterone. Where is it going? And is that what's causing my problem? Because maybe they got a blood test and everything looked quote unquote normal, but they didn't feel normal. And what happens is we peel back the layer of the test or the onion of the patient. We find like, oh, your problem's actually in the pathway not in the actual hormone itself. Yeah, it's very fascinating how you can see because there's kind of step by step with the hormone where, mm -hmm. where, where there was a skip, the needle skipped. And you're like, why are you making all this DHEA and no estrogen? Like what? 
<laughs> going on there. And I think that's really where your brilliance comes in. You know a lot more about that than I do. So I, I love to kind of hear any little like, bits of knowledge you want to impart. <laughs> you're welcome to. Um, I think you should be able to share your screen. So if okay. you're comfortable with that. Yeah, I am. Let me, um, let me make sure I have your test. Um, I even created my, your own little, your, I have my own little folder for you. Perfect. I know. Okay. Hey, you so. guys, we were organized. Just we had technical day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, nope. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. You have to okay. Let me, let me work on that. Oh, make, make co-host. Okay. Try now. Okay. Yay. Okay. Okay. So we did have some specific questions come in. I'll, I'll um, take those in a bit once we kind of get the swing of things by looking at a couple tests. Okay, and um, let's let's start with, um, actually we'll, I'm gonna start with, because I have a couple, I have a couple of options. I have, um, I think this one will be the most um, relevant. So let me, let me share this, here we go, share. Um, tell me, can you see my screen? Yep, perfect. Um, maybe, yeah, there we go. Let's see. Oops, I'm just, there we go. All right. So, all right, you can still see it and it looks. Yeah, so this is page one, everyone. There's a lot of pages on this test, but yes. then there's a few key pages, so we won't. We won't we're, we're gonna, every we're gonna, page. We're going to skip to the highlight. So it's six pages of actual concrete data. And what we, we're big on visuals. So we're big on putting everything into these dials. And so when you look at the dial, we'll just stay on this page for a second. Um, this is the summary page. And the dials are read like a gas gauge. And so in between the star are obviously the low and the high range. So example, estradiol, 1.8 is the low end, 4.5 is the high end. And when we give results for females, no matter their age, we always give the luteal range, which is the range in between the stars. And we give the menopausal range, which is the purple little um, rectangular box um, below the left star. And the reason we give both ranges for estrogen and progesterone is because we don't know where women are with their cycle. We don't know where women are with their age. We don't know, maybe the practitioner, some practitioners want their menopausal women to be in the range of somebody who's in their 20s. And so since we can never make that call, um, we always give both ranges no matter what. And sometimes women just like to know, they wanna know like, where am I compared to other women? You know, if, you're, if your estrogen's low, how low? If your estrogen's high, how high? compared to um, a cycling woman range or a menopausal woman range. So if we move on. Well, like, can I point something out here? One hey. way. This yeah. woman, this example woman, she's 63. And this estrogen is a reproductive type estrogen. It's out of range. It is. So it's way out of first. range. Woohoo, what's going on here? She's on estrogen. She's yes, on a yeah. very high dose of estrogen. Okay. Yes. So we have had that question. What if I'm taking hormones or I did recently? Yep. It doesn't mean you have to get, get off. It's, mm -mm. Just, it's showing what, how your body's, what's actually happening in your body with that. Exactly. Hormones. So she is actually on estrogen, but not on progesterone. So this is the summary page. So it's a quick snapshot of estradiol, progesterone, testosterone, and then um, the cortisol and your total DHEA production. And this is just to give you like a quick look of like what's going on. But what we're going to do is we're going to skip to page two. So page two is where we list everything out by line item. And it's a lot, you can see it's a lot of hormones and it's a lot of probably foreign words for a lot of people. But we make it easier by taking this page two and we put it in dials on page three so that it's more um, well graphical and it's easier to understand. And we add the arrows because the arrows are part of what's called the steroid pathway. So this is sort of how your hormones are made and where they go in what direction in your body. So you kind of just follow that, follow along the arrows and see where, you, where you're stuck, <laughs> see, where, see what's going on for you. So this woman is 63, but it could easily apply to um, women who are estrogen, just estrogen dominant in general. You could be you know, 23, you could be 33, you could be 43. It doesn't matter, you, this, this pattern is very, very common. So if you look in the upper right, and I think, um, 
I think I can be cool about this and I can I can oh, draw. Look. look at you. <gasps> I know. So this you. I know. All your tech has you would think be. after using Zoom so many times I would know this by heart, but sometimes I still have to play with it. Like, what am I doing? Okay, so where I circled that, those are your progesterone dials. And again, in between the stars, the range for a woman who's cycling. And the purple range is the menopausal range. So her progesterone is pretty, it's pretty low. Everything's facing under the star and down by the menopausal range. And you'll see that we actually give two um, progesterone metabolites. We give something called a B pregnenodiol and an A pregnenodiol. Now, why is that important? I like it a lot because the B pregnenodiol is the most abundant in the human body. But it's the A pregnendial that um, is able to convert into another, it keeps going down the arrow, it converts into another metabolite that goes into the brain and touches on your GABA receptors. And GABA, of course, is your like calming, soothing, relaxing hormone. So when I see women tell me I'm getting more anxious and I can't sleep and I can't relax, I feel more stressed out, then I pay special attention to that A, that A pregnendial especially if she's not ovulating, especially if she heads into menopause, because that's when it tends to flare up the most, those symptoms come the most. Um, and I know that if I can get her progesterone better balanced, generally her sleep and her anxiety improve as well. So we like that A dial. So may I ask a question here? Yeah. So she's 63. She is yes. postmenopausal. Yep. So to me, the being in the purple or near the purple is kind of normal, mm -hmm. but you're, are you saying even for her age, you, she's low? No, but what I, no, 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 she's not. But if she was maybe 23 or 33, right. then okay. yes, gotcha. yeah. she's okay. not at 63. She's so I think that's an important note if you do get the, if you do run a test, cause you feel like, oh my gosh, I'm in the purple. It's so far down, right. but that's actually pretty normal. If you're 63, you yeah. may want to supplement, but that's sort of your God given place in the hormonal dial, so right. to speak. Right. That age. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So then what we do is we compare um, estrogen, uh, progesterone to estrogen. So if we switch colors to pink, we run your three big estrogens. So your E1, your E2, and your E3. And your E2, estradiol, is of course your most potent. Now she's on, she's 63 and she's, she's on hormone replacement. But let's pretend she's 33 and she's not. So a 33-year-old woman might say, I'm having PMS, I have heavy periods, I have clots, I have breast tenderness. Maybe she has endometriosis that's pretty bad. Um, you know, maybe she's developing fibroids and cysts, um, you know, just all of these things with estrogen dominance, mood changes, weight gain, because that estrogen's way up in the red. She's above the star. She's above the luteal cycling range compared to her progesterone. We like estrogen and progesterone to be facing about the same direction. Okay. And she's not. <laughs> she's on way too much estrogen replacement. <laughs> okay. Yes. So that's good information for her doctor or for her to adjust. So, and within our own yes. practice, I can just speak for myself. We, we can do some topical hormone replacement, but we can prescribe heavy hitting hormone per replacement. Um, so I kind of want to point out, I think there's uh, many women in our community are afraid to do any hormone replacement. Right. And maybe you can comment on that, but I think it can be really helpful and it doesn't have to be a forever thing either. So, right. and right. you can always retest to see how you're doing. But what I notice in my own community is there's, there's quite a fear of hormone replacement. If you see this chart, you might be thinking oh, that's well founded. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. I, that is true. And obviously the big, big concern is breast cancer. Um, even though endometrial cancer is another concern, but breast cancer is what all women get concerned about, understandably. What's interesting, there's a really good book. It's called Estrogen Matters, and it's by um, Dr. Avram Blooming, where he walks through the um, WHI trials um, that kind of blew up estrogen replacement therapy and you know, really pointed to the fact that it can increase the risk for cancer. So he kind of walked through all of the research about that and then all the subsequent research that came out about that. And what I found really interesting about that book, which I think women 
um, gave me like really gave me pause is that the number one killer for women is cardiovascular disease, and the risk of women de developing Alzheimer's is increasing substantially. And one uh, the biggest um, thing that we have going for us as women to prevent cardiovascular disease and to reduce our risk of Alzheimer's is estradiol. Mm. And so even though yeah, absolutely breast cancer is scary, don't get me wrong. Um, he makes the point like the majority, 99% of um, stage one breast cancers are, he calls curable. But if you're going to die of cardiovascular disease or God forbid, you know, you develop Alzheimer's, it's a risk benefit um, should you do estrogen therapy um, in your life, you know, and really taking a look at all the risks that you have. And then of course, you know, is it, is, do the good outweigh the bad? Because we know estradiol really helps brain health, bone health, um, cardiovascular health, skin health, mood health. Um, I mean, it helps so much. And so I understand a hundred percent too, right? Carrie has it, some yeah. benefits too, which it is, does. I mean, it helps write more about, yeah. Estradiol, it gets vilified a lot, understandably, because when it's at, it's like Goldilocks, right? When she's too high, like she causes symptoms <laughs> um, for sure. And when she's too low, she causes symptoms, hot flashes, night sweats, you know, joint pain, vaginal dryness, you know, brain fog, all that stuff that women don't want either weight gain. You can't win in the weight department with estrogen too much or too little and, and you gain weight. But um, yeah, so I, so I'm just very careful with women, but I also point out, you know, like we're going to do what we can using the Dutch test and other markers to try to lower risk as much as we can. Um, but I'm also don't want a woman to get to 70 years old and go, woohoo, I never had breast cancer, but I'm on four medications for my heart and I've been diagnosed with dementia. Ugh, that's a good no, point. Like, like that's yeah. not a healthy life either. So I'm, yeah. So I would read the book, Estrogen Matters. It's, it's gave me some really big pause for thought on estrogen. So speaking of, let me, let me show you some yes, of these details while we're, in. while we're talking. Let's so look at the metabolites. Mind. So this is another good use, you guys. You know, we mostly run the Dutch Complete, which is a little more expensive, but if you want to get on some topical hormones and you're worried about getting too high, we can rerun a more limited test just to see how those are going. And I will say, I've seen lots of women on hormones and they're still tanked out. They still aren't showing up on this test. <laughs> So it can go both ways, actually. So that is the truth. That is the truth. So here, um, down here, this is where we get into estrogen detox. So we're going to switch. Let me switch colors. We'll go to green, or oh, green, uh, orange. So all everything I'm drawing in orange. These three dials right here are your phase one estrogen detox. So all of your estrogen predominantly gets detoxed in your liver. It can do it other places and other cells all over, um, but predominantly happens in the liver. And keep in mind, detoxification of estrogen occurs every second of every day, 365 days a year. So it's interesting. I have women that ask me like, oh, I want to do an estrogen cleanse to get it out of my body. I'm like, no, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You make estrogen every second of every day and you detox it every second of every day. It doesn't take holidays off. It doesn't take, you know, national, you know, like Labor Day off. It doesn't do that. But when we look at estrogen detox, it's a three-part series. And our test, Dutch test, looks at two, the first and second step. So think of it like a clawfoot bathtub. So your phase one detox, which I have highlighted here in orange, is the water coming into your bathtub. You need the right kind of water and you need it coming in at a, at a happy rate. And then phase two is the ability of your drain. Is your drain open or not? And then phase three is where you get it out of your sewer line and away from your house. And of course, that's your intestines. So this is phase one. So if we look at phase one, first we'll start um, at the bottom. So this is two, this is your two pathway. Now it's two, four, and 16. Your two pathway is considered less carcinogenic. It's not necessarily healthy, but it is a lot less carcinogenic. And we want to encourage this pathway because once this pathway does go through the drain of your bathtub or what's called phase two, then it does become healthy. Um, the next step for two is actually quite beneficial in the female body. Unfortunately though, the four dial is the most carcinogenic. Um, and what it can do is it can go down this, this naughty little pathway here that says quinone. And the quinone are what um, can bind to your DNA 
and break out causing holes. And trust me, you don't want holes in your DNA. That is what increases the risk for mutation and cancer formation. So we want um, less of the four pathway and we definitely want it to get through the drain and out your sewer line. And then at the top here is your 16 pathway. And the 16 pathway is a mixed bag because it's proliferative. So it's great for bones, bad for boobs. And maybe bad for like the lining of your, of your uterus and it can cause like full tender breasts and it can cause like heavier, clottier periods. So it can cause those estrogen dominant type symptoms. And you can see in her case, she is in the red. Her, um, her 16 pathway, if you again, follow the dial is, is right, it, there it is at 4.7. And then um, her four is at 0.8 and her two is actually um, not, it's like at the star. So we need to switch her. We need to switch her away from the 16, definitely away from the four and down to the two. We wanna favor that, that two pathway with her because she's probably estrogenic all over the place, all over the place. And we, we that's not making her happy. Yeah, and I love this pie chart you guys have because it gives the ideal percentage and then where the yes. person's at. So you can see how completely overblown her 1608 pathway Absolutely. is. Absolutely. So this pie chart tells you the percentage of estrogens coming through um, your water at the time. So this, and this is, this is, this moves. So if you have less estrogen coming through, the pie chart may adjust and you have more estrogens coming through, the pie chart may adjust as well. So you can see the patient percentages on top and then the expected below that. So the expected for 16 OH is three to 30% and she's at 45.4%. So of all the water coming into her bathtub, 45% is the proliferative 16 pathway. And at a 63 year old woman, I, like, I'm glad for her bones, but I'm not glad for everything else. So I would wanna switch this for her. So I'm gonna, I wanna pick your brain a little bit about all this. So we do know she's taking too much estrogen. So that's a kind of an easy one to, right. to adjust. But why do you think, and this is something I'm still learning about, we're going to do more writing about, why do you think she is pushing so much to 16 OH? Is that her diet? Is that genetics? Is that what? It, it, it could be all of the above. So I'll, um, I'll back up and show you, um, let's see here, here, oops, meditate, clear, clear all drains. Okay, so here is your CYP3A4. So that is the enzyme that pushes the 16 pathway. And some people absolutely have an upregulated CYP3A4 genetically, um, but it could, there also could be things in their diet and lifestyle increasing this. For example, like um, grapefruit juice <laughs> will increase CYP3A4. And so you have to be careful. This is why they say all the time, don't drink your, don't drink grapefruit juice with your medications because it will upregulate um, and, and clear it out of your system faster. Um, and so it's possible for her that's she just has a really high uh, in upregulated you know enzyme here, and that's pushing it. Okay. okay Other so things will like bad ahead. things can push it. You know, like environmental toxins and chemicals can can, can push this. I believe like BPA can push this. Um, yeah, you have a page here. further along. I don't know if it's like page eight. We or what do it is. our steroid pathway. Yeah. So that actually. Does kind of highlight a few things it could possibly be you know that or updating going. that oh you are okay cool yeah. yeah that'll probably be released I would I want to say like next week we're updating a brand new steroid pathway or updated I should say yeah and you guys I'll, I'll be completely honest like of all the tests we run the Dutch is how can I say it? Comprehensive. <laughs> it's very comprehensive and it just yes. often creates even more questions certainly that can all be addressed and answered. But if you want to answer the question, well, why is it pushing this pathway? It's a bit of a tough one. We, what's in, what kind of toxins are in your body? But we can do some things like we, we can look at your diet. You know, some people are still drinking a lot of wine or smoking or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we can look at that. And then there's, you know, certain herbs that we know, supplements that we know that can adjust these pathways, even if we don't totally know the reason why quite yet. And, and some people do know. Some people have gone ahead and done 
genetic testing, right? Some people have done the like consumer mail-in genetic testing. Are they working with a practitioner, right? Who's already done it. And they'll go, oh, here it is right in my report. I, mine is the fast kind. And that's yeah. what's going on. Yeah. So if that's something you've already run and you know about, this could be a great test. I, you know, I love this section when there's been, you know, cancer in the family, you know, kind of reproductive cancers. If you are on hormone replacement, uh, this is just such a fascinating section. It's kind of the toughest section, I think. Yeah. <laughs> because you're like, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Um, but it's just, I think this is of everything in the Dutch, like the most fascinating, the most informative. I don't really think you get this anywhere else I've seen. Um, it's, it definitely, and it's um, applicable to both men and women, you know, like obviously a lot of women go to the doctor, but um, compared to men, men don't tend to like to go to the doctor, um, but men have issues here too. Men have lots of estrogen issues and they get yeah, belly we'll fat and they get those. breast development and erectile dysfunction and all this stuff. So yeah, we'll look yeah. at a male test. Soon. We will. I remember actually the one of the first Dutch I ever ran was for a male client of mine who was vegan and he was making so much estrogen and he didn't mm -hmm. know where and he wasn't very lucky because I had just <laughs> started running these. So I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> um, but you know, it's just like you, things aren't always what you think they are until you start, you know, until you run some of these tests. So that's yeah. another thing, thing I think is extremely valuable. We are looking at a woman who's in this case, taking too much estrogen. Some mm -hmm. women have too much estrogen, but I mm -hmm. find a lot of women think they have too much estrogen and they do not. And they do not. And it's, a, and it's not estrogen. I do get that question a lot where people will say, um, well, I have all the symptoms. I'm like, I know, but a lot of the symptoms overlap. It could be something else. Um, it's kind of like fatigue. People will say, I'm tired, and then they'll run their cortisol and their cortisol will be normal and they'll be really upset because their cortisol is not low. And I'm like, but fatigue, you can have fatigue with about just about every other hormone out there that yeah, you all make. Sorts of reasons. So all sorts yeah, yeah, nutrients and chemicals. Yeah, we just had a client in that exact scenario. And I was like, yeah. no, your hormones look great. So whatever's yeah. going on for you, you can cross this off the list. Right, which is this. good to know, but also sometimes, you know, a little disappointing, yeah. but it's okay. For sure. <laughs> Okay, you want to show us okay. phase two? Yeah, so this is phase two. So when we go um, in the lower left-hand section, actually, we'll change color so it's easier to see. We'll go back to pink because I like pink. Okay, so this section is your phase two. This is the drain of your bathtub. This is the ability to get from this thing called OH, which is known as hydroxy, to a methoxy. And methoxy is actually, especially the two methoxy, is actually really protective in the body. So our whole goal is to get to a methoxy as fast as possible and then get it out the sewer line. We like this. And we call it methylation. This is the form of detoxification. There's, there's, you can detoxify um, several ways, you can, like sulfation, glucuronidation, this is methylation. And methylation primarily uses COMT up here. Now, you would think with methylation, people go, oh, MTHFR, um, I have that. So that must be what it is. And actually, MTHFR is a small part of this methylation where COMT is, is the big player. That's the big player. And basically, what it does is this M, the M here, stands for it's methyl transferase. And basically, what it's doing is it's giving its methyl on to, from the hydroxy, and that's what makes it a methoxy. So we, we like when this works well. Unfortunately, though, hers is not working that well. <laughs> hers is down in the menopausal range, and we want it higher. And we make it easy for you. We give you this graph over here, and she is pointed towards the low end, um, leading to the left, which tells me that the drain of her bathtub is open, but not open wide enough for the amount of estrogen that she has coming through. And especially once we start trying to shift her away from the 16 and towards the two, um, then she will really need that drain to be open um, because much more two water, gotcha. two hydroxy will be coming through. So yeah. Carrie, would you wanna see the, the two OH dial at the same level as the two methoxy dial? Yes. Okay. Yeah, generally, generally we want them pacing about the same direction. We want it to be about, um, I believe the math is roughly uh, 
60, we want the methoxy 60% of the hydro, 50 to 60%. So I would want it closer to like 2.4, 2.5, 2.6, somewhere in there. Um, the methoxy. Okay, because that, that would equal the same on the dial exactly. level. Okay. Her is 4.8, yeah. So you said that this isn't just MTHFR, and I'm really glad you pointed that out too, because I do see people with MTHFR still looking good here. So yes. what are they doing right that that's going well? Right. So when we're, when, we, when we're looking at methylation with when it comes to COMT, it's a huge circle. And it's where we go from homocysteine um, around to something called methionine. And then that makes that converts into COMT and the back around again. And to go from homocysteine and methionine and back around again, there are several, several, several nutrient coenzymes. For example, magnesium is a huge one. Um, CME is a big one, um, zinc, B12, choline, um, trimethylglycine. So it's entirely possible that her MTHFR is, has a mutation, or both of them have mutations, but everything else is fine. Everything else is totally fine. And so she has enough of those coenzymes and no other mutations that her cycle goes round and round, no problem. Yeah, and this is a great example of where, where it's diet and lifestyle for the win. You know, you yeah. can really support this. Uh, and yeah, with maybe some targeted supplements too as needed. So I know a lot of people worry that they're a poor detoxifier, that they have the MTHFR, which is what people seem to be the one that people know about the first. Right. Um, so, so, you know, great news. Uh, and I like how you pointed out as we try to change this balance, you got to make sure this phase two um, is cleaned up as well. Yeah. So there's some maybe modulations to do in her phase one and then modulations in her phase two. Um, I am very fortunate that I got to ask Dutch some of these questions um, as, as I see something unusual and we're developing supplements in our shop to support these different pathways. So it's really exciting, especially when people are, are really scared that they are a poor detoxifier, they have cancer in their family, or, or they were supplementing with hormones for many years without mm -hmm. and checking them. So th this is just gold for those mm -hmm. folks. And the great thing is, is that it's uh, very modifiable. You know, you're not stuck with this. We can do something about it. It's not a death sentence. And I think women and men love to hear that when I'm like, all right, let's, we need to make big changes and these dials will change. So if you were to put someone in a protocol, carry, we'd say three months or six months, how long to. So usually change? I do in a cycling woman. I mean, I know she's 63, but in a cycling woman, it takes about three months for the developing follicle, the primordial follicle in her ovary to go to a full blown, like the chosen one who's going to ovulate. It takes about a three month process. So whatever I do with the cycling woman, I generally do it for three months before I evaluate because I wanna know, I know the status of her health, the health of her follicle now um, and how, how it's producing hormones or what, and what her periods are like and things like that. And then I wanna know three months from now because by then she's, she's on to a whole new follicle. Like it's like, you know, wardrobe change and everything should be getting better. And now in this woman's case being menopausal, I may choose three months, but she's, she's not cycling. Um, I may choose three months or I may even go a little longer depending on her symptoms. I may go more like four to six months because if I make changes for her and she feels amazing, if she's like, this is great, all my symptoms are gone. I don't even have hot flashes um, and you know, whatever then I may say, great, let's write it out, keep doing all these changes, and then let's check more at like the six month mark. Um, but I definitely want to keep an eye on somebody like her because she's on estrogen. So I don't want her to go Too years, long without yeah, years without and all of a sudden she's like, oh, I never got my test again. Oops. <laughs> um, and she wasn't doing what she was supposed to and the dials didn't change and she's at huge risk. Yeah, and I will also say I err on longer because mostly, oh, it, it took me three weeks to get my supplements. It took me two weeks to start them. Then I want to make yeah. you know, this yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I yeah. would pre prefer to go a little longer and then hopefully see some improvement than go too soon. Right. Um, and yeah, and if we just want to run a section, that's um, an option that yeah. we can run. So as, as you scroll on, Carrie, I'm just going to say to people, I see some questions trickling in and we'll take those later. Uh, I want to kind of get a full look at this test first. I want to go back to her androgens because 
Okay, so these are her androgens. So we went through progesterone, we went through estrogen and estrogen detox, and so now let's look at her, her androgens. So androgens are DHEA and the metabolites and testosterone and the metabolites. And she's a really good um, example to show because, now she's 63, if we look, here's her, tes here's her testosterone. There, we don't necessarily, um, we don't have a purple box for, for testosterone to show menopausal uh, range. And the reason is that we don't put the box there is we do have age ranges. However, I find testosterone is very, very um, individual. I think there are some women who tell me like, oh, my whole life, I've never had high testosterone or, you know, normal testosterone. I've just sort of always been kind of borderline low level. And other women tell me I have had high testosterone or healthy, robust testosterone my whole life. And now I've, I've fallen really far. So I'm very symptomatic. So we just give the two stars, but you can see she's down at 1.5 and she is 63 years old. Testosterone is supposed to fall. Testosterone is made partly out of the ovaries and her ovaries, of course, are not producing hormones anymore, which means that the other, other areas that make testosterone have to make up the slack um, or not in her case. But then we look at DHEAS up here. Um, so I'm drawing a little arrow for you. So her DHAS is at 26. And then what happens? So this S, S means it's sulfated and that's not active. DHAS is not the active form. Now you have to take the S off and this arrow should really be two ways to get to DHEA because DHEA no S is the active form. And then it goes down to androsinodione and then that can make testosterone or it can keep going to make these two metabolites that have the craziest names ever. One is called etiocalanolone and one is called androsterone. Who named these is beyond me. Not helpful. And the reason this is important is I can tell a woman like her, your DHEAS is on the lower end at 26, but your metabolites are good or actually even elevated. Um, if we switch colors, her androsterone is actually high at 1,810. So this tells me she actually has plenty of DHEA, but she's not sulfating very well because mm. her, her S is not like sort of like in a good range. It's kind of low. The most common reason a woman would not sulfate very well is inflammation. Mm. So there's this sort of like secret subtle um, way on the Dutch test I can go, oh, I bet you have inflammation because it's affecting your ability to put the S on your DHEA. Now, it affects the ability to put the S on other hormones, including estrone, which is E1. And so that means she has more estrone in circulation, and she does, her estrone is high. Um, so I already know that. And so with her, I would go, let's find your, let's figure out where all this inflammation is. Is it your gut? Is it your joints? Is it, you know, toxicants? What is it infection? You know, is it, you know, Epstein Barr, Lyme, mold? Um, and then by addressing that, it will greatly help her DHEA markers. The other thing though, to that rounds out the inflammation, and we'll switch colors again to red, is that her five alpha preference, down at the very bottom, five alpha preference, it's androgenic and she's leaning to the high end over here. She's, she's way over on the right side in the green. And androgenic means you're more prone to cystic acne on your chin and your jawline. You're more prone to hair, male pattern baldness on your head as a woman. You're more prone to hair growth in places you surely don't want, like your chin or your belly or around your nipples. You're more prone to mood swings in the angry, irritated, I have no patience <laughs> like form. And so, and what pushes this, um, inflammation is a big reason to push this direction but insulin issues can push it as well. So she kind of has this double like, ooh, she's inflamed because she's not putting the S on and she's favoring this androgenic side. And on top of it, I wanna make sure her insulin and blood sugar are okay. So even though we don't test blood sugar and insulin and we don't test you know, viruses and you know, mold and <laughs> the gut health and all this stuff, I can look at a Dutch test and go, oh, we have more rocks to turn over because that's what's affecting your hormones. Yeah, yeah. I'm just so excited about everything. <laughs> but we should all be paying money for this. This is amazing. Yeah, this is why sometimes with Dutch, I was trying to put in words earlier. It's like, oh, 
something isn't going right here and we don't know what, but it's suggestive. And you just gave me some new ideas. You know, I didn't even know all the things you just explained, but there's some other areas we might hit on with the next test where I have been taught, well, this could suggest thyroid, this could suggest this. Yeah. It's so fascinating. Yeah. This androsterone, I just call this angry testosterone. I guess it's technically a yeah, metabolite. Actually, I like that, angry <laughs> testosterone. Because <laughs> I'm like, you're making a lot of angry inflammatory yeah. testosterone. Um, and yeah, that could be showing in, in certain ways for fertility and hair loss and hair growth and that kind of a thing. So yep. um, yeah, so super fascinating for some of these you know, hormone symptoms, I feel like are so irritating and feel so inexplicable. You're like, why am I this moody again? Why am I growing these hairs again? Whatever. (laughs) Yes. To see it, you're like, oh, that's why. And that's why why I have no patience. Yeah. There's some things right off the top we know to correct. And then there are some things we want to dig deeper. I'm just going to mention, this is why we just introduced Carrie what we call a big three test where we test the gut, the thyroid, blood mm-hmm. sugar all at once. It's still not testing for mold or certain other things. That would be a $5,000 test. <laughs> <laughs> but it gives us like a better big picture because often the gut is a source of inflammation. Often blood sugar, I find mm-hmm. in our community, isn't being managed as well as people think it is. I 100% agree with you. Yes. Yeah. So that's a, that can be an oversight. So um, yep. thank you so much. Yeah, this is, this is great. What do you want to move on to? Okay. I just want to point out one more thing. Even though we have a guy's test, I just want to, let's pretend, let's completely pretend this is a man. This is a 63-year-old man. Um, inflammation also increases aromatase. Now, women, we totally aromatize. Now, aromatize is a fancy word of uh, converting testosterone into estrogen or converting androstenedione into estrogen. Um, but it is much more noticeable. It's much more um, um, problematic, really symptomatic, I should say, in men. And so if he were a man and I saw this, I would, I would you know, think to myself, self, um, he one his S, DHEAS is lower than it should be. Two, he fables the five alpha, and three, his estrogens are high. This man is inflamed, and gotcha. and I would know that's the root cause. So instead of having to like, you know, give him DHEA and give him five alpha blockers and give him you know estrogen blockers, which I may as a band aid, I know what the root cause is. It's inflammation and maybe even blood sugar insulin issues. And when I address that, poof, all of this will get better. Yeah, that's so helpful. Yeah. And sometimes, frankly, it takes some testing like this to do this push. That client, I remember, I still remember this case. It was a vegan man. We tested him <laughs> all this estrogen. You know, he had, he had a lot of sugar cravings mm-hmm. and he wasn't too overboard, but there was just something off in his mineral balance diet, whatever, that, you know, he was really craving these sweets. And, you know, it'd be kind of healthy sweets, but still right. sweet. So I wonder, you know, there's sometimes things like that. And when you get a little push, when you see these results, you're like, okay, it's time right. to like make some changes because we I can all get in our habits. Absolutely. That is for sure. Okay. Let's look at her. Um, we'll skip, skip, skip to her cortisol, cortisol, cortisol. Okay. Um, so I think her cortisol's, oh, no, it's low. <laughs> I forgot. So we, okay. So on the Dutch test, there's my little, my little drawing. Oops. We do look at melatonin. Now melatonin is made um, in the evening as it gets dark out. And then it, you know, is made much higher through the night. And then it gradually falls, falls, falls as you get closer to waking up. When you make that melatonin, you make it and it gets put in the bladder. And then in the morning, you urinate it out. So on the Dutch test, we collect your overnight urine, excuse me, your overnight melatonin by collecting it in your first morning urine. And if you happen to wake up in the middle of the night, then we have you collect a strip, um, a test then as well, uh, because we want to know, you know, what's going on with your cortisol at that time. And her melatonin, it's um, 18, 10 is the cutoff. Um, so you definitely could optimize this more. Definitely talk to her about sleep hygiene, right? Getting off her phone before bed and you know, what's she doing at night? Is she having caffeine too late in the day? Is she having a glass of wine or three, you know, at dinner and just anything that's suppressive to melatonin? Um, I would want to just talk to her about, cause I don't want her melatonin to get any lower. 
So Carrie, there's a gentleman on your team and he advised me that this melatonin was made in the gut. So this was, he kind of considered it a marker of gut health. Is that something you agree with? So majority of melatonin is made in the gut, right? It's made in the enterochromaffin cells, but it absolutely is made in the pineal gland, which we know, and all the gut and the pineal end up in the bladder. So it's a combination. Okay. That's very interesting. It's a combination. Yeah. Yeah. And I think someone else on your team told me they like to see maybe more around 60 would be ideal or what would Um, be? And it depends on the person, I find. Some people have this level 18 and they sleep fine, no issues. Um, And other people, yeah, have a lot of issues. Okay. Um, If I do see a higher melatonin, like in the hundreds, you know, maybe it's 150, 160, 200, then I do definitely start to think gut is one of the big reasons. um, Because that go high? That's what I'm saying. Because if it's made in the gut and the gut's inflamed, um, it might be making more melatonin as a um, an antioxidant, and uh, melatonin is good for other things in the gut. Oh. And so it's possible that, um, like, I believe melatonin is higher in um, un, uh, in celiac disease that where you haven't taken the gluten out yet. <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> have know. seen one client where it was way, way off the chart. So yeah. that's a, a little clinical pearl there. Yep. Now it will, of course, increase with supplementation. If you take supplement, if you take melatonin at night, your melatonin on the report will be in the thousands. It doesn't mean you're taking too much necessarily. It's just the way melatonin goes through your liver, what's called through first pass effect. She ends up in the bladder and then it, it, has a, it gets br- basically broken apart into thousands of pieces. And that's why it looks like thousands on the Dutch test. Okay. But, you know, interestingly, another um, uh, dark cherries <laughs> are really high in melatonin. And so a lot of people will do cherry juice. Um, like dilute cherry juice at bed to help with sleep because of the melatonin effect. Cool. So in Oregon, um, as you know, as you used to live here, cherry seed, we just got through cherry season. And so we can always tell at Dutch because the, our <laughs> local melatonin are always higher. <laughs> That's awesome. Yep. Um, okay. So then we look at total DHEA, which is just basically everything on what we just looked at, put on the adrenal page, because this is the adrenal page. So Ta-da, we just do it again. Then we do two different markers. So what I'm going to do, actually, I'm going to And Carrie, you said DHEA is upstream of DHEAS or the other way around? DHEA is the active form of DHEA. Um, so no S is active. S is inactive. Oh, okay. Yep. Which is why we look at the metabolites, because it gives us an overall general idea of how much uh, DHEA is probably in the body and is it able to get downstream? Is there enough to get downstream? Okay. And in her case, there for sure is. There what? There is just some things yes. that are getting blocked. Yep. So then if we come down, I'm gonna show you. Where's my here we go? Okay, so then we look at something called metabolized cortisol. Metabolized cortisol is a fancy word for um it, uh, how much cortisol is produced in the day. It's basically cortisol production. So your body makes tons and tons and tons of cortisol, um, free cortisol. And then whether it's used or not, it gets degraded, goes through metabolism, and it becomes these markers called THF and THE. And so it's about 80% of your total production in a day um, in your body. And it's nice because it answers the question, can you even make cortisol in the first place? Like, is your HPA axis from your brain to your adrenals able to communicate and tell, you know, from the brain down, make cortisol? And she for sure can. She's at 5,930. So she's, she's borderline high. Now, why would somebody have high cortisol output, high cortisol production? It's, obesity is a big one. Uh, stress is a big one. Hyperthyroidism is a big one. So anything that would cause the uh, HPA axis to fire up, really, um, would cause this number to go up. Hmm. Now, in her case, though, here's what's interesting. I'm going to scroll down so you can see the, the number of if the free cortisol. Oh, I should have cleared my, clear my drawing. Clear. Um, her free cortisol is low. So now you're thinking to yourself, well, self, that's weird, because she's making heaps of cortisol where is it going? Well, what happens is when you make and clear that much cortisol, not a lot can hang around and be free because it's getting cleared faster than it can hang around. So her free cortisol will drop. 
So what it tells me is that if she has a lot of stress or she has blood sugar insulin issues or she, has, she is obese, that I need to absolutely work on that because it's affecting the metabolism of her cortisol and it's not allowing her free cortisol to hang around. So as a result, she has low free cortisol levels. But this is where the Dutch is really, really helpful because if you just saw this section in pink on a saliva test, this is it, that's all you saw, you would think, oh my gosh, she has no cortisol. I'm going to give her all sorts of stimulatory stuff, licorice, glandulars, adaptogens, everything, maybe even cortisol itself to get her up. And she might say to you, she may feel good initially, or she might say to you, oh my gosh, I have insomnia. That makes me nervous and anxious. I feel jittery, but I don't understand. I have low free cortisol. And the reason is she doesn't need, production is not her problem. You have to go back to what is driving up the, the liver metabolism of her cortisol and slow it down. Which is, every, okay. and everyone's like, well, what magic supplement is that? I'm like, well, I don't know. It depends on the cause, right? If it's blood sugar, insulin, address it. If it's infection, address it. If it's pain, address it. Mm. If it's hyperthyroidism, if she's on too much medication or too much supplementation, cut, cut it back. Okay. And then, That's and very help, interesting. It'll help fix her, um, her free cortisol. Great. That's a yeah. really interesting case there. And then just as an aside, we do look at cortisone. Cortisone is the inactive form of cortisol. So um, inactive. And the reason we look at the, the inactive form is because sometimes people have a deactivation problem, meaning they have low free cortisol, but their cortisone is a lot higher. And that tells me that the body is deactivating it to cortisone. And that's the treatment for that is different. So instead of being a gland problem where the brain isn't telling the adrenals to make it, it's actually all getting deactivated. And so you're trying to reactivate it. Okay. Keep cortisol around. So right. that's not the case with her, but it's why we do cortisone. It's just to give you more information about where is her cortisol going <laughs> and is it getting deactivated? Okay. Yep. So on the Dutch test, I can tell you by, by um, having all this information, um, I can use the metabolized, oops, the metabolized cortisol here to answer the question here, to answer the question, am I able to produce it? And then I can tell you how much is free, how much is getting deactivated, and then I can tell you the pattern in the day. So I can give you, and I can tell you your melatonin. So I can give you so much more information um, on a Dutch test the Dutch complaint. Mm -hmm. And the Dutch complaint. Yeah. And I, I want to point out too, I mentioned this earlier, you know, sometimes you can be right in the min middle of your cortisol range and you're yeah. really tired. And so it's not everything isn't cortisol. Everything I mean, is not cortisol. So just it could be. But it's so still very things. valuable, very interesting. So especially great. when it is low across the board. Like for example, this woman is tired. Absolutely. I mean, she's making she makes enough cortisol, but as fast as she makes it, poof, it's gone. She metabolizes yeah, she's it. Very her well. body. She's very so she well. is tired. Absolutely. In this case, yes. In this case, for cortisol sure. is a problem for cortisol. her fatigue. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's not a production problem. It's a clearance problem. So we have to address the clearance. Okay. Yep. So Carrie, I want to time management a bit. Do you want to look at the last page for five minutes or so, then look yeah. at a male sex hormones for a few, because I then we can yeah. see some questions are coming in. So this is, the, these are the Dutch extras. So the Dutch extras were where we look at nutritional markers. So B12 and vitamin six, uh, B6. We look at glutathione here. Um, we look at dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine metabolites. Melatonin we've already seen. And then we look at a DNA damage marker. So we give these organic acids as extra fun information for you to put together with the comprehensiveness of the test. For example, in her case, her 2B6 marker, metabolite markers are high. And oddly enough, it's the opposite of what you think. The higher these are, the lower her B6 is. Gotcha. So since they're both significantly higher <laughs> than the range. Um, she is definitely B6 deficient, um, and I would definitely want to supplement her with B6. Um, however, the glutathione marker is, is, is exactly what it means. Low levels <laughs> means low glutathione. <laughs> 
So it is a little bit confusing when you're when you're looking at the test. And then down here we have um, HVA and VMA. These are your dopamine and norepinephrine, epinephrine, or adrenaline metabolites. They are not direct measurements of dopamine and adrenaline, but they are metabolites of. So they just give you some more insight as to other hormones because these hormones are not only brain hormones, but they're also in your systemically in your body too, as to what's going on. They're also very dependent on certain nutrients like iron and B6, and her B6 is uh, low. And they are also dependent on two enzymes. One we've already talked about, COMT, and the other is MAO. So, so people who have MAO or, or COMT issues will often have um, issues here. Okay. Yep. And then so, lastly, her DNA damage marker is getting higher. And yeah. this, is, this is absolute. The higher this is, the more DNA damage she's having. And because her estrogen is high and because her water and her drain of her detoxification pathways are not good, I do not want this to get any higher. This freaks me out because this is a direct indicator of DNA damage. Yeah, that's definitely high. Like I don't yeah. really see that. And right. any, I haven't seen that yet on a test. So yeah, I would pay attention to that for sure. And I love having the glutathione there as like a detox nerd. I love that. And yeah. I've been doing women's health for a long time. Those B vitamins are really important for hormones and detox and energy too. I love B12. Mm -hmm. It's such an easy thing to supplement with. So, um, you know, some of these occasionally you're, you know, are a little confusing, like, why is the dopamine high? What's going on? Because it's not a full, full, full test. But sometimes it's, you know, you find something really helpful on this page. Right. Especially like um, I was consulting earlier with somebody who um, had a lot of anxiety and their cortisol was normal, their progesterone was normal, their estrogen was normal. But this, this VMA marker was, in, in the case of the person I was talking to, was really, really high. And I said, well, I wonder if you're anxious because your adrenaline is actually, you're really high. <laughs> in your system. Um, and so it's an adrenaline thing for you. It's not a cortisol, progesterone, estrogen thing. Um, yeah, very interesting. you know, like it just gives you some other insight, like, Hey, you know, go down that rabbit hole and see what we can do there. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So let me switch to, I'm going to stop sharing just for a second, just so I can pull up the right, um, the man, let's see here. Dodge picks. Mm -mm. Here we go. All right. Um, share. Here. Ta da! Can you see that? Yes. Okay. This is a 42 year old man. Um, it looks a little bit different because I had to cut out all his. Um, HIPAA information. <laughs> um, and so nobody can see that. But so this is a man. Now he is a really good example because his, so in men, we have all the ranges for ages right here on the right, upper right side. But as we know, age range and optimal range are not the same range. And we know men's testosterone sadly has been falling, falling, falling through the years. And so labs have to adjust their normal ranges for the current state of testosterone. So I will have many a man who says, well, I'm in my range, but I still have all these symptoms. I'm like, yeah, you're probably not optimal. You probably wanted to be in the range of 10 or 15 years ago, but labs have had to adjust, which is very sad and unfortunate, but that's what's happening with men's testosterone. So if we start with his androgens, um, so if we look at you know, all of his, just like just like with hers, we do look at DHEAS, testosterone, um, etiocalanolone, uh, angry testosterone, I love that, androsterone. <laughs> but because with men um, and, and prostate health, we give a little bit more information down this angry 5-alpha pathway, be again, because of their prostate. So we do look at DHT, which can be a big player for prostate, um, but it's similar symptoms in women. Men can get cystic acne, men get ma uh, male pattern baldness, um, men get angry and irritated and lose their patience, and then of course they get all sorts of prostate issues. So in this gentleman's case, all of his androgens are kind of on the low end of normal. For 42 years old, I mean, I would, his testosterone should not be this low at 42 years old. It's no wonder he doesn't feel that good 
And then on top of it, as I mentioned earlier, he is doing that aromatized thing. Oh, you can't really see the yellow. Let's do green. He's doing the aromatized thing to estrogen. Right. So aromatase, aromatase. And his estrogens here are in the red. So this gentleman has weight gain. He has breast development. He's tired and he, erectile issues. He's not motivated. And, you, and it's a combination of low testosterone, high estrogen. And like I said earlier, um, big reasons are inflammation and uh, blood sugar and insulin issues, which he's just perpetuating because he's gained weight because of his low testosterone and high estrogen, and he gets stuck in this vicious cycle. Okay, so this okay. could be somewhat inflammatory diet, toxins, yep. stress, maybe lack of certain nutrients. Yep. Okay. It's also important to note men make testosterone in their deep sleep. So if he's not sleeping that well, he will struggle to make testosterone. Mm. So sleep is a big one that I look to for men as well when it comes to testosterone. Okay, great. Yeah. My other concern from him, just really quick, just to yeah. show you, he favors the four pathway down here. Oh, he so, sure does. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So even though, even though this is a guy, I still don't want guys to go down this pathway. This is the pathway that can cause DNA damage. Um, and if this was a girl, I'd be, you know, same thing. I'd be really concerned because of, of, um, of risk. So I'd be doing things to try to mitigate that and put him on the other path. Okay. The good thing is he methylates well in the lower left-hand corner. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So you don't want to be, you want to be, is there, is it bad to be too high or what, what's the deal with the high range? With, with methylation? Yeah. Um, so some people say yes. So we can't, we do not, we're not able to tell you if your COMT is fast or slow. Um, ex outright. Like we're not testing your COMT. We're just testing the activity that we see. Um, but elevated or fast comp has been associated, um, or uh, what do they call it? A fast methylator has been associated with some things, certain cancers, uh, I believe colon cancer, certain colon cancers are one of them. Um, and so it, it's not uh, without its risks as well. So yeah, so I was listening yeah. something about that, about DNA methylation and how it can be some, some places too fast, some places too slow. And it's something mm -hmm. I want to learn more about because it's very fascinating. Yes. So yeah, very but we are, since we, we're not a, we're not a, we're not a genetics company. Um, all, but if I see it really, really fast and, you know, and maybe somebody's already done their testing, their genetics, I'm like, Hey, let's look at your COMT and see gotcha. if you have the best version. Cause, okay. Um, Awesome. Carrie, do you mind if we switch to some questions? Sure, of course, please. Okay. Question away. I have to. Do you want to stop share just so um, we yes. can see your share. lovely face? Here we go. Okay. <laughs> so, if there's a question I think we've kind of covered, I may skip it. So, try to get all of them in. Um, Elizabeth had a good question. How much do hormones fluctuate for postmenopausal women? Is it, you know, if she took a test one day, would it be potentially quite different the next week? Not in a postmenopausal woman, not in her hormones, uh, or her sex hormones. Her estrogen, progesterone, testosterone will probably be about the same roughly day to day, um, but her cortisol might be different. So if she does a test on um, a Sunday and it's a nice, relaxing, lovely day at home with her family, then you're going to get Sunday cortisol. And if you have a horrible, terrible, no good, very bad day on Monday, but you test then, you're going to get cortisol on that day. So we do recommend with postmenopausal women, you can test any day because you don't cycle, but we strongly recommend you pick a typical day. Busier, don't, don't, a little bit busier yeah. day. Yeah, I just yeah. recently learned that too. And we've been starting to advise that um, as well. So it's you know. people will test. I mean, we'll get tests in and they write right on it, you know, like tested on vacation in Hawaii. I'm like, well... <laughs> <laughs> that's great, but I don't think that's your typical. <laughs> okay, let me read a couple. One, one asked, one person asked about um, can it detect, I guess, primary ovarian insufficiency for someone who's 38 years old? Um, it is really helpful. So a lot of practitioners will use the Dutch in conjunction with other markers like FSH, which is a blood draw, um, to determine that because there'll be, uh, you know, really suboptimal levels of estrogen and progesterone. And okay. sometimes um, they'll, women will do, which I don't have an example of, but they'll do a cycle mapping, which I don't 
recommend if you don't have a cycle. It's where you collect no. a test every single day. Um, but I've seen it before. I've seen practitioners want to do it anyway. And it's just, you'll just have this really low flat line. And I'm like, ooh, at 38. Oh, this, right. If you yeah. get it for a whole month. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And we do, you know, unfortunately, we just sent the cycle mapping to the wrong people. So I'm going to try to not keep those in stock because mostly we don't use cycle mapping. But if mm -hmm. you were having fertility problems mm -hmm. and your cycle's really irregular, then then contact us about cycle mapping. Mm -hmm. The disadvantage is it's missing all the extras. And if you want those extras, you're kind of paying double because you're getting so many yeah. tests. But you can if, we, if yep. you want yep. to go that way. I, I may consider doing it for myself, Carrie, because I... You should. It's my favorite <laughs> test. The cycle I know mapping? I know it's more expensive, but I like it because it gives you all the data points um, throughout your cycle. And in any hormone, any estrogen progesterone test you do is a one day snapshot, right? And so right. Um, like my women who say, or your women even, you know, like I get migraines and I get them at ovulation and I get them before my cycle. It's like, well, if I, I can see the actual rise and fall or not. And I really like that. Or we had a woman the other day who said, I get symptoms these days. I mean, it was like day eight, <laughs> day 12, you know, day 22. Like she was very specific. And I thought, well, you need to do a cycle mapping because. Yeah. Yeah. There's certain things. I really am recognizing that I am pretty much PMDD like <gasps> for like a week. And I honestly, it takes, oh. it took a while for me to see the pattern. But yeah. I have a different personality. I'm just dark. I'm very negative. And oh. then that, yeah. And I'm like, I need to see what's happening for a good 10 days there. Cause yeah. you know, that that's, you know, cause it's, I need to treat it and, and really to, to get, I might need, I need the complete, I the extras are nice, but <laughs> I, I really need to see yeah, what's imbalanced that's right. affecting my mood so much. So there are instances to do it, but we mostly you know do go ahead. I was going to say that the A, the A metabolite of progesterone, the alpha pregnenediol, there's some good research on that in PMDD and how um, there, there are A pregnenediol blockers because when it binds to the receptor, it's a, there's a, it's a broken receptor and it actually is encouraging PMDD. Okay. So, I'll have to go back and I did test yeah. last fall. So I have to go back and look. And just a note on that, like if you're testing this and not having a practitioner, um, you know, really look at it, you can miss things mm -hmm. like I miss <laughs> <'cause> I <didn't laughs> <nobody look> it. <laughs> so it's, it is helpful you know I do I do still work with Dutch sometimes to be like what do you think of this what do you think of that and it's, mm -hmm. it's so fascinating because that we are real you know you really see the spectrum we we all have different things going on we are we're not all in the same boat so it's pretty pretty great uh, let me read a few more here Carrie da, 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 da. Um, Someone's just asking about how it compares to blood testing. This is kind of a long question. Um, so I'm going to skip some of it, but maybe we'll cover that. What, how, what, is it more accurate to blood test in some cases or better in any case? Yes. So in blood tests, you don't get any of those pathways. You can't. So if you want to know what your estrogen metabolism is, if you want to know if you go down that angry, you know, testosterone pathway. Um, that's when you need the, that's when you need the urine testing. You can absolutely in blood test, you you can do estradiol, you can do progesterone, you can test DHEA, you can test testosterone. Um, so you're getting the surface level, but if you want to go deep underneath, then that's when you need the urine. Okay. And I use serum. I definitely, if, if a woman says I I'm pregnant, then I will say, go get your blood drawn. Let's look at your proge progesterone. Um, yeah, you know, there's certain like cases good. where you want to double it up or you're already yeah. seeing a gynecologist or a reproductive endocrinologist. So, yeah. okay, here's a good question about um, estrogen, progesterone. I'll do a little disclaimer. We are not giving medical advice. We cannot give you medical advice. We're just nope. talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think that postmenopausal women should be on estrogen replacement in general because of its benefit and oh. if so should it always be along with progesterone so i'll answer the second question first if you have a uterus you were kind of required by hormone law to be on progesterone so if you are postmenopausal and you decide to go on estrogen with your practitioner um, you have to go on progesterone to protect you from what's called hyperplasia and potentially uterine cancer we don't want that and the only two ways to protect you are oral progesterone and vaginal progesterone. 
topical has not been shown in the research to protect you and sublingual the like little dissolvable you know mints or whatever um they have not been studied and so if you okay. have a uterus you have to as far as your first question goes um i definitely can't answer that <laughs> that's an opinion question it's, yeah. it's opinion and i know you know like risk factors and genetics and lifestyle and even though they've largely said family history doesn't have much play um like for example, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother died of breast cancer. She's the only person in my family who had breast cancer. Am I worried about my breast cancer risk because of her? Nope, not at all. Now, if my maternal grandmother, my aunt, and my mom all had breast cancer, I'd be a little more concerned. <laughs> you know, like, hmm, this is coming down the line. This doesn't look good. Okay. So, so do I just blanketly recommend estradiol? No, but do I recognize its benefits for cardiovascular brain, bone, mood, and skin? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's very personal. As I said earlier, a lot of people in this community I find are very nervous about taking estrogen. Look, mm -hmm. if you're feeling great, yeah, don't worry about it. But yeah. if you're not feeling great, maybe it's some things to consider that we talked about here. Right. So I have another meeting sort of soon, so I'm going to kind of try to rapid fire some questions. I may yes. have yep. you pull up carry another test because there's <laughs> the Krista thyroid. called me the out thyroid. that yeah the um if you can show how cortisol may suggest some things about thyroid we can talk more I, about that absolutely um, so let's Trista, yeah you're right Tristan we didn't cover that um that's my it's that's the greatest it's, a, it's actually yeah. how I got um to find out I had Hashimoto's carry yeah. did you know that <gasps> I don't think I did know that. Mm -hmm. I think mean, you reviewed my test and you were like, this could mean you have a thyroid problem. <laughs> and I was like, great, <laughs> awesome. So, oh. you know, sometimes these are rabbit holes, but I actually found out my thyroid problem and then a few months later found out the mold problem. <gasps> often go hand in hand. You often go hand in hand. And mold. So, yeah. so, yeah, it is such often will make more questions. But do you want answers? Yes, you do. You want to know yeah. why you don't feel well. So on the Dutch test, um, we do not test thyroid. That's only done in blood. Don't ever do that in urine. Um, but this is the thyroid pattern. When you're metabolized, oh, that is a horrible arrow. Let's try that again. There we go. When, when this marker is facing to the left and this marker is facing to the right, we strongly suspect it's a thyroid problem. And so, and the reason is when your thyroid slows down, it slows everything down, including the metabolism and production of cortisol. And what that means is the liver can't metabolize it very quickly. So what happens is your free cortisol at the bottom builds up, builds up, builds up. And so it's not actually an adrenal problem. It's a thyroid problem. And when you address the thyroid, the adrenals, the HPA axis corrects itself. Often. Or it can be, I think, an HPA itself problem is what your colleague told me. An HPA, say like again. Maybe he said this could be thyroid or an HPA problem. So the can big I reasons when, the, when, when, um, actually, oh, when the metabolized cortisol is low, the big, big reasons, hypothyroidism by far is number one, whether it's overt, subclinical, cellular, uh, autoimmune, any of the above, that's the big one. Um, the other big one is our just sluggish liver because this has a lot to do with liver clearance. Okay. And then lastly is an, um, a history, a substantial history that we, of anorexia or disordered eating. Wow. We'll slow okay. this down because it affects the enzymes in the liver for survival. So those are like the big, big three. Now, when you see this pattern, should you address the HPA axis? Yeah, absolutely, for sure. But I don't think the HPA axis is at fault. I think, I think it's thyroid or liver. But what do you, what do you think about? I, I emailed you this, but I don't know if you saw it. What do you think if the brain is inflamed and it sort of inflamed the HPA area? So if the brain is inflamed, usually we'll see this this metabolized marker elevate. Oh, elevate. So elevate. Okay. But what happens over time because as your cortisol goes up there's a feedback loop and the feedback loop is negative. So the high cortisol in the body tells the brain, wow, there's a lot of us out here, stop making it. So then the brain, even inflamed, will gradually make, have less signal to the adrenals and now your cortisol goes down, down, down. So in a chronic brain person, inflamed brain, I will see both the metabolize and the free cortisol below. Both of these dials will be That's low. what I see. 
that's yeah. kind of what I've yeah. been. I don't suspecting. see this. The, mm-hmm. bec- this is a not, okay. So not high on still on the free low Correct. and low. Yeah, I, low and low. Yeah. I agree and maybe with high that. and high in the beginning. Okay. You know, like if you get so. an exposure and you're acute, it probably and you immediately you're, test, up. Okay. you're probably high and high. Okay. Um, but over time, most people don't realize it until later on, and then they're more low and low. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a piece I just put together that I'm like, duh, because you know, there's things throwing off your hormones. And I really want to explore more of this, you know, how toxicity is expo- throwing off our hormones. But it's digging deep in, in some mm-hmm. of the research to get to all that. Okay, I'm going to take two more questions that I thought that were just quickies, I think. Um, one was 23-year-old male with balding. Could this help? I think the answer is yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. <laughs> and yep. then there was a girl, three, 13 and a half with severe PMS. I think you guys say usually to be cycling for at least a year before testing. I suggest a couple, at least a couple cycles. A year is great, but okay. um, 12 is as young as we, our age ranges are set for 12, older than 12. Um, so if she's 13 and she's had three or four cycles at least, absolutely. Test. Okay. It can incite a lot of stuff. Okay. Maybe we can take this one last little one about non-organic meat. Would that be showing as high E2 in men? Um, oh, it, um, so, chem- so synthetic chemicals don't show up on the Dutch test, but certain things can increase aromatase. So they can increase the creation of estrogen. So like BPA will, um, there's a fertilizer, atrazine will, um, there's something other, something else will increase. I mean, I think the, the, I think as the more and more research comes out on this, we'll find out probably everything. Naughty. Right. So it's not the meat. <laughs> it's like sort of what's in the meat. Exactly. Yeah. Is, is whatever is hormone meat. chemical spray that the meat, the cow has been sprayed with or whatever, then, and then you eat it, it could potentially drive up aromatase. If yeah. anything, it'll, it's something your body has to detoxify and it will slow down detoxification in general. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you for giving us this extra time. Um, I have to go soon. The only reason I'm ending, but you probably have to go soon too. Yep. I really appreciate like basically everyone stayed on this call. Like, I love amazing. it. Um, your, I really your community is fantastic. People. They are fantastic. I really appreciate you guys being live. It makes it so much more fun for us to see you on and have your questions. I, I really appreciate it. We'll be doing this every week and often we'll have some kind of special offer for showing up or just that work is current so that's our dutch complete being 50 dollars off with the consultation i put the link in here it's through um, monday so it gives you you know if you miss some of this and you want to go back and watch it you need to you know whatever it gives you a few days to think about um it so that's through monday it's a great great deal um carrie is wonderful she is she cannot interpret <laughs> tests for you. <laughs> they have to have some boundaries between lab and practitioner. So that's where we come in um, to help you sort through your tests. As you can see, it's pretty complicated and it's, I don't recommend ordering it on your own. Mm-hmm. I think it's just too tough. Um, so yeah, thanks again for being here. I put the link to the test in here. We will send you, gosh, this is our first of these series. So I'm not sure quite how <laughs> we're gonna follow up with this. Um, but we'll put this on YouTube. You know, we will be reminding people about the sale ending over the weekend for people who are on our, our list. Um, Betty, yeah, these are my dogs on my bed. <laughs> they don't do any work while I do all the work. Uh, and it's just easier to have them in here so they won't bark. <laughs> um, Carrie, I love you. I haven't interviewed Aww. you in like two years. I'm like, why have I not interviewed her? In so I know. You're this amazing. is wonderful. This is so, so great. Thank so, you so much. Yeah, let's like keep this going. And I really appreciate your time. I know you're really busy. And Happy to help. I loved it when you reached out. I always appreciate working with you. Yeah, it's so great. We're kind of getting our systems up to get this accessible to more people. And it's so exciting. So yeah, I just really appreciate your time. If you have any questions that, or you didn't want to ask publicly, you can follow up with us um, as well by email. So thanks, everyone. Really appreciate it. Bye. Bye.